Philippians, Philippians, turn your Bible to Philippians chapter 4. I don't know about y'all, I'm just glad to be alive this morning. I don't know, I don't know, I'm just glad. And also, I, we're just delighted to have, I tell you, one of the best uh, basketball players to come through the state of Texas, and of course he came through the best high school in Texas, Cashmere, Carl, Carl Godin. Let's get Carl a hand. Carl, Carl, him and his partner there, Carl Belcher, I tell you, uh, that team of 75, right? 75. That was probably the best team ever come through here. All you Wheatland Yates folk, don't hate, don't hate, don't hate. Y'all had some pretty good teams. But what they did, uh, Carl, good to see you, man, and we'll never forget you and you and your friend now, you and Carl uh, Belcher, and, and, he, and the two of them, along with our own Gary Foreman, Gary may be in the back with the money, but they will be going into the, inducted into the Cashmere Ring of Honor in a few weeks. Give him a hand, give him a hand, and we're going to support you, and don't tell me good things don't come out of the north side, and, and the gardens, and the Trinity Gardens, and Cashmere Gardens, and Fifth Ward, and even some of y'all in the 4-4 over there in Acres Home. Anybody represent Acres Home, the 4-4 in here? Yeah, I've got a few of y'all in here. Amen. But you know what? We're all in this thing together. Amen. And I tell folk, don't, don't forget where you came from, who shaped you. We learn to love God coming up in those times. So let's turn your Bibles, if you will. Turn your Bibles to um, Philippians. And let's look at chapter 4 and verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious. That is, don't worry about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And here's the part to highlight. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding. I like the way I learned it as a boy, Paula, the peace that passes. How many of y'all heard it that way, understanding? That's what the old folk used to say. The peace that transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Father, thank you for peace that only comes through Jesus Christ. Father, we love you. Open our hearts to the word. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Last week in our study this month of December, as we were preparing and focusing on the birth of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we found out that as we looked at the birth of Christ in the manger, in the cradle, we found out that you, you, you give your gifts at the cradle, but you receive your gift at the cross. And we found out last week that when we looked at the book of, book of Matthew and we looked at Luke, as we looked at the story, of the birth of Jesus Christ and we looked and we saw that at the cradle, at the cradle, at the manger that everybody who was a part of it brought something to it. We found out that God, even God the Father in heaven and he brought uh, the media, this guy's not turning, that he brought us the, the gift of unity unity um, because if you look at the genealogy of Jesus you'll see that God went through 42 generations and in those 42 generations he brought uh, different ethnicities and different races together different languages and Jesus was multicultural he was cosmopolitan yes and we saw the unity being brought together by God to, to, to produce a baby named Jesus. If he was going to save the world, he needed to look like the world. 
and he did. Also, we saw that uh, Joseph gave Jesus, baby Jesus, the, the gift of a caring father. Every child needs a caring father. Every son needs that. Every daughter needs that. Or a caring father figure. We saw that Mary gave the gift of the power of a loving mother. At the, at the cradle, at the cross, the, the angels gave him the praise that comes with angels. And, 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 and we saw the shepherds gave him a testimony. Everybody brought something. And we saw that even the, the wise men, they brought gold and myrrh and incense. Those were, were gifts and perfumes you give to a king and to a messiah. Everybody brought something there. And I'm going to ask our media to take this and turn this. I don't know. This guy is not popping, so should be okay in just a moment. But last week also, last week also, oh, there we are. Last week also, thank you. Last week also, we, we left you with a question. And the question was, and I brought this gift here, this box, which represented the gift of Jesus. And we left you with this question. I got, I got. We left you with this question. What do you choose? Freedom or bondage? And what Christmas is all about, it's about making a choice. If you choose Jesus, you choose freedom from fear, from doubt, from addictions, from the pain of the past, from past mistakes, freedom. Jesus said in John 8 and 36, you shall know truth, and truth will make you free. But if you choose freedom, well, what does it look like? But when you open the box and you choose freedom, what does it look like? And we found out that it looks like peace. It looks like peace. True freedom is when you have peace. And you're able to sleep at night. We live in a world where everybody is looking for peace. You know, uh, I come in periodically and I'll tell you about, just to let you know what's going on in the, in the world, just so you, we'll, we can appreciate the sanctuary of being in the body of Christ and being near the cross. And unfortunately, this week, it was more bad news. In Chowton View, three young people broke into a person's home. I think it was a mobile home, and the guy was waiting on them. He didn't wound them all. He shot them all dead. All of them. A 46-year-old woman was having a Christmas Eve birthday party. With her, with her friends and with her family and with her father and her mother and her ex-boyfriend. Busted in there. He wasn't even the current boyfriend. He was ex. Busted in there, drove her out, and shot her dead. And listen, these weren't babies. You know, people talk about, where's well, the young people. They ain't the young, all the young folk. He's 52. People are searching for peace. We said last week, Washington is a mess. They fussing and fighting and calling each other names and tweeting on social media. We got all these problems. They acting like children. Amen. Starting from the White House. And then, and then even in our personal lives, we struggle. On your job, you got deadlines. You got quotas. You got to make this deadline. You got to do this on the job. You got to watch who you talk to. There are some folk on your job, not only will they stab you in the back, they'll throw you out the bus, drive the bus, run over you, back over you, and lie and say they don't even know what happened. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. The politics are brutal. On the job, on your, on the job, and then you come home and you got your children. Little Johnny wants something, and Mary wants something. Mama, I need this. Dad, I need this. Grandma, can I have this? Can you fix this? They find you got to break it up, and, and you got to get on them to make sure they they not into something they shouldn't be into. And you got them pulling on you and pulling on you. And then if you are married or in a relationship, you've got all the stress that goes with that. Sometimes y'all getting into it, or you're fussy. It's just stress. Everybody wants something. 
You know, David had stress in his life. David had family problems. And we go through the stress of trying to pay bills and you, you're trying to pay this note and pay insurance and get this fixed. And you go up to the school and you got to talk to the counselor and you got to talk to the principal and you try to talk to the, to the teacher and you, they need to do this, they need to do that. Well, David knew what it was like to have these problems too. David's son, one of his sons, murdered the other son, had one of his sons try to kill it. And then, and then David's boss, who was also his father-in-law, hunted him down and tried to kill him. So your son trying to kill you, and now your father-in-law trying to kill you, who's also your boss. Somebody might say, well, my, my, my boss don't like me. Imagine if your boss was trying to kill you. And then David's best friend, Ahithophel, got with his son and tried to kill him, tra tracked him down. And David said in Psalm 55, David said, if I had the wings of a dove, I'd fly away, I'd get away from all y'all. And, 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 and sometimes it looks like everything has just got you stressed out, you can't sleep, and you got anxiety, and you just have bad nights, and you go through all this, and you want peace. And so that's why you need Jesus. Isaiah said, Isaiah 9 and 6, for unto us. Yeah. And by the way, y'all that us. Yeah. Us. Yeah. Us. That's you. Just tell the person next to you, that's me. That's me. That's me. That's me. Unto us. Unto us. A child is born. A son is given. The gift is going to be packaged in human form like a child, a son. And his name shall be called. And in the Bible, when it says his name shall be called, a person's name denoted their nature. That's why you need to be careful what you name your children. Okay? You name somebody, that my little gangster, he gonna be a gangster. Uh -huh. <laughs> Even nicknames, you gotta be careful what you call them because in the Bible, that they took on the nature of their name. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. Literally, in the Hebrew, it means a wonder of a counselor. Listen, when you get counsel from God and from his word, you will wonder how in the world did God do what he did? Because some of us got some bad counseling in 2019. Wonderful counselor. The mighty God. God can do anything. The everlasting father. Literally what that means, he is the father of things that last forever. If you want something to last forever, the source of it, the father of it is Jesus, the everlasting father, Isaiah said, the father of things that last forever. If you want things that will last forever, then Jesus is the source of it. The everlasting father, the mighty God. And then this part, he said, the prince of peace. He is the custodian of peace. He is the custodian. If you want peace, you got to go to Jesus. But the question is, here's the question, though. The question is, what does peace look like? The Bible tells us there are three levels of peace. First of all, there is peace with God, and that's spiritual peace peace. That peace is eternal. Peace with God. The second level of peace is emotional peace. That's when you have peace with yourself. A lot of people don't have peace with themselves. That type of peace is the peace, the Bible calls it the peace of God. That's inner peace. And then the third type of peace is relational peace. That's peace with others. That's external peace. And the Bible says that's peace from God. So you have spiritual peace. That's the peace with God. You have emotional peace, which is an internal peace. That is the peace with yourself. And then there is a relational peace. The last two, the emotional peace and the relational peace, the peace with yourself and the peace with others will not happen unless you have spiritual peace. Now let me show them to you. Show them that they're right here in the Bible. In fact, I have the scriptures all right there on the, on the text, on the board. If you look at Romans chapter 5 and verse 1, look what the Bible says. Romans 5 and chapter 
chapter 5 and verse 1. Look what the Bible says. Therefore, since we have been justified, I love that word, Lionel. That means I'm all jacked up, I've messed up, but because of Jesus, I've been declared righteous. Oh, yeah, that's something. What that means is that, is that, is that when I stand before God, look what the text says. Therefore, we have been justified through Christ. We have peace, watch it, peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the peace that comes with God through Jesus. You don't get this peace based on what you do. You get the peace based on what Jesus did 2,000 years ago on the cross. And I don't know, every once in a while, Brother Green, I think about that, and I think about how the fact that Jesus went to that cross. For me, I'm going to use me, Tim Daniels. Sin. But God say, Tim Daniels, I need to kill sin, but sin is in you. And to kill the sin, I got to kill you, but I love you, and I don't want to kill you. I love you, but I hate the sin. But I got to kill the sin, but I love you. So he said, I got to fix that thing. And furthermore, even if I killed you, it wouldn't pay the price for sin because the, 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 the creature that has to die for your sin has to be a sinless creature. So you really got a problem. So he said, I'm going to send my son, Jesus, not an angel, not the archangel Michael, not Gabriel. I'm going to send my only son. I'm going to wrap him up in human form. I'm going to put him on a cross, and I'm going to kill him. You know, most people say, well, the Romans killed Jesus. The Jews killed Jesus. The Bible says God killed him. He killed him because that's the only thing that satisfies the price of sin. And then he did something, Lionel. He took my sin, y'all looking at me, he took your sin too, put it on his son, killed him. That's mercy. But he did something else. He gave us grace. Because then he took his righteousness and transferred it to me. I had sin in me and on me. Jesus had no sin in him, but our sins were on him. And that means when I come before God and I need a prayer and I need a blessing from a child, I need a blessing for healing, I can boldly come before God even with my issues. And say, Lord, I need you. I ain't got it together, but I need you. That's peace with God. And it's settled once and for all. Some of y'all who are Christians worried about your salvation. Am I going to make it? I made a mistake. Your salvation ain't dependent on you. It's dependent on Christ. That's just like your child waking up every day. Mama, am I still your child? Daddy, do you still love me? You say, why you keep asking about that? You my child, you will always be my child. And when you get your doubt, God, do you still love me? Am I still your child? Am I in or am I out? Am I saved? Am I not saved? He said, why you keep asking me that? I saved you when you were jacked up. I'll make you better. By the way, you got justified. That's once and for all. But then God sanctifies us. That's a lifetime process. That's why he cleans us up on the inside. And so you have, look what he says. He said, we have peace with God. Now, look at Philippians chapter 4 and verse 7. Philippians 4 and verse 7. The Bible said in Philippians 4 and verse 7, he said, and the peace of God which transcends understanding. That's emotional peace. And then you have the peace from God. Look at Ephesians. And there are a number of verses that talk about this. Look at, Ephes look at uh, Philippians chapter 1 and verse 2. He says, grace, verse 2, grace and peace to you. Where? From God. NIV. So those are the three levels of peace. But here's what peace is not. Now here's what peace is not. And you need to tell people when they talk about you need to be at peace with me. Peace is not me enabling you and your craziness. Because I'm for well, the only way you and I can get along, you got to give me what I want. My, I, peace is not me enabling you and your selfishness and craziness. That's what it is not. In your wrong, that is not. 
Number two, peace is not you disabling me. Letting you in my space. There are some people who are so destructive, so toxic, they will disable you. You won't even be able to sleep at night. They'll keep you so nerved up. They're selfish. So peace is not me giving into your selfishness where you are disabling me where I can't fulfill my destiny and fulfill my dreams because I got to keep you satisfied and keep you not mad. That is what peace is not. Amen. The third thing is peace is not me loving you. Listen, peace does, peace does not mean I do not love you. Let me show you something in, um, um, uh, turn with me to, uh, if you will, on the screen, Romans chapter 12. And look what he said. In Romans chapter 12 and verse 17. First of all, he says, do not repay anyone evil for evil. I need to put that verse in there. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. Now watch this. If it be possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Now here's what he's saying. As far as it's on your side, don't do anything to destroy the peace. But he said there are some people who are so toxic. If you let them in your space, they're going to mess you up. You won't sleep. And, and, and the fact that they are not in your space doesn't mean you don't love them. That doesn't mean you don't love them, but you are not going to let their selfishness get in the way of your destiny. That craziness mess you up, so they can't get close in your space. You're going to have to love them from a distance. That means if you're in trouble, I'm there for you. If you need something, I'll help you out. But I can't be close to you like that because you're too crazy for me. And you're too selfish. So peace is not those things. And then, how do we get peace? Turn with me first of all. we look at a couple of verses. Look at uh, John chapter 14. You get it when you come to Jesus. John chapter 14. Look what the text says. This morning I got my small letter Bible. I think I should have gotten my big letter Bible. I know. I'm a little bit older than some of y'all might think. Or maybe I am as old as some of y'all think. Uh, look what the Bible said. This is Jesus in St. John chapter 14. In St. John chapter 14... Jesus is about to go to the cross, and he's talking to his 12. Every, every important event in their lives, Jesus had been there with them. Uh, when Peter's mother-in-law was sick near death, Jesus came in and healed her. When, when, when they didn't have food to eat in St. John chapter 6, it was Jesus that took two fish and five loaves of bread and fed them with takeout bags left, to, to, to left over. Yeah, when the Pharisees were on them, it was Jesus that stood and got the Pharisees off their back. Every important event in their lives, when they were on the Sea of Galilee and they thought they were going to drown, it was Jesus that said, peace be still. But now Jesus is saying, I got to leave you. And the text says in St. John 14 and verse 1, they were not at peace. And it says their hearts were troubled. But then he tells them something. In verse 27 of that chapter, he said, guys, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. He said, the peace I'm going to give you, you don't get it from a pill. You don't get it from a bottle of Jack Daniel. Y'all didn't know that my cousin did y'all, Jack Daniel. I need to call the family. No, I'm just kidding. You, you don't get it from having a big old house. Because two people can live in a $400,000 house and hate each other. You don't get it from drinking, driving the finest car. He said, the peace I give you ain't like what the world gives you. The peace of the world is phony, it's fragile, and it's fleeting. It's different. I'm giving you a different kind of peace. Well, how do you get it? Let's look at Matthew chapter 11. Let's look at Matthew chapter 11. And verse 28. So look what he said. He said, number one, Jesus. 
verse 28, come to me. How do you get peace? Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Now, some people confuse coming to church as coming to Jesus. Now, 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 you wonder why so many people who come to church so many years can act so hellish? They came to church, but they never came to Jesus. And that's why preachers have to be careful how you preach the word of God by implying that to get to Jesus, you come to the church. No, 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 you got to twist it. You come to Jesus, then Jesus puts you in his church. Being in church is a byproduct of coming to Jesus. I'm going to give an altar call here later on, but I'm going to say to you, come to Jesus. When you say come to the church, that's us. And if you come to us, then you're going to see we are broken, we are fragile, we make mistakes, and then we're going to let you down. That's why people, when they get it confused, they think I got to come to the church instead of coming to Jesus. Now, you need to attend worship, but you come and give your life to Jesus, and he puts you in his family. And when they come to the church, and when church folk let them down, they leave Jesus and the church. I'm saying to you this morning, come to Jesus. And if I let you down, if anybody, and I'm going to let you down, people are going to let you down. But Jesus said, I'll never let you down. And no matter what people do, you are holding on to God's unchanging hand. So first of all, he said, you come to me. But then look what he says. He says, take my yoke upon you, verse 29. After you come to Jesus, you connect with Jesus. In the Bible, they would yoke two animals together, especially in the Old Testament. And they would do it so that one animal would not have to carry the whole load by himself. So Jesus said, connect with me. So you don't have to carry the load you're carrying by yourself. And then he says, comprehend me. He said, learn from me. We're going to talk about what that means in just a minute. But if you look at, at, but if you look at the text, and let's turn back with me. When you come to Jesus, the question is, who comes to Jesus? Look at the text. He says, come to me, ye who are weary, NIV, and burdened. The King James Version says, you who are labored and heavily laden. Who comes to Jesus? People who are burdened. NIV says weary. You know what weary means? Weary means I ain't got no more fighting me. I'm tired. I'm tired of the same old fights, the same old arguments. I'm tired of the load. I'm just tired. And then it says heavily burdened. That means the whole load is on you. Come on, man. When they get in trouble, they call me. When two people are not getting along, it's on me. The children's needs are on me. Getting the bills paid, it's on me. And you got such a load on you, he said you are overwhelmed. You are stressed out. You are overly burden and you get to the point where you don't want to see nobody all you want to do is come home and folk let you alone all y'all get out I don't want to see none of y'all get out get out I don't know maybe I'm the only one anybody ever felt like that all y'all get away from me get away y'all be honest now everything is on me somebody somebody needs to go to the doctor I gotta get them now somebody's having trouble in school they call me and they ain't my child It's all on me. Here's the point. Storms bring you to Jesus. And if you read the Bible, most of the people who came to Jesus because they were overburdened, they were stressed, and they were in the middle of a storm. You remember the man whose son was possessed by demons? He came to Jesus. The man whose daughter was about to die? He came to Jesus. Mary and Martha, that, that brother Lazarus, was dead? They came to Jesus. The 12 who were on the boat in the Sea of Galilee, and that was a storm, and they thought they were going to drown. Who did they wake up? Wake up Jesus. I'm saying to somebody here, you need to wake up Jesus. Stop calling your homeboy. He can't help you. He needs Jesus too. Sometimes you call the preacher. He needs Jesus. Storms drive you. And I'll tell you now, I'm going to just speak for me. I need to be closer to God. I may be, I need to be closer to God than what I am like all of us. But the closeness that I do have with Jesus is because of the storms in my life. Amen. And if you think about it, it's true. It's your hard times that bring, now you may not be as close as you want to be. Uh -huh. But where you are and your closest to Jesus is because of storms that have come. 
And when the storm comes, don't go to the wine bottle. Don't go smoke a joint. It ain't gonna do nothing to make you hungry and make you gain weight. I know something about how what you know about that. that why, why folk all in my business, Lena? Why they in my business? I'm trying to help somebody. They're all in my business. I ain't know it make you hungry and give you the munches. Hey, y'all bad. This is the bad, bad, bad. Y'all been bad. Storms drive you to Jesus. And then he said, come to Jesus. And then he said, connect with Jesus. Oh, by the way, let me say about storms driving you to Jesus. If the storm drives you there, when the storm is over, stay there. See, some folk, the storm driving to Jesus, say, oh, it's over with, I'm going. Stay there. Because if you leave, trust me, he's going to send a greater storm to drive you right back there. And then you connect with, turn to Philippians, if you will, chapter 4. And this is how you connect. Philippians chapter 4. Now, first of all, if you are not saved, let me just say this here. If you are not saved, you've never been connected. So when, before you leave here, if you are not saved, then you need to get, put your faith in Jesus Christ, and you need to be baptized in water for the forgiveness of sins, just like a lot of people at this church has done this year. But even when you are saved, sometimes you lose your connection because of the storms and the stress, and you feel distant from God. So how do you reconnect with God? Look what he says in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. And by the way, when Paul wrote this, he was in prison. If anybody had a reason to be in turmoil, it was Paul. But Paul said, let me show you how I can rejoice. He said, rejoice in the Lord always. But let me skip down. Verse 6, he said, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, here we go. Here's how you reconnect with God, by prayer. Prayer is adoration. That's when you tell God, I adore you for who you are. You created the universe. You created me. I adore you. I love you. Some of the songs that we sing in our praise and worships, they are songs of adoration. Yes. To the wives in here, when was the last time you just got your husband and you say, baby, sit down, sit down, baby, sit down. And you looked him in his eyes and say, baby, I just adore you. I, well, I got quiet. Let me talk to this other side here. Yeah. <laughs> I adore you I love you and I adore you for being the man you are you're a good man to me you're good to these children you're a good provider you love the Lord and get real close to him because see you can tell how a person feels about you by the size of the pupils of their eyes so when you get close to a person and the pupils of the eyes dilate and they get wide, that means they have a strong affection for you. If you get close to them and those pupils get tight and narrow, <laughs> bad day, bad day. You're going to have a bad day. Gwen, is going to be a bad, bad night. Bad day, bad night, all right? So that's why you got a line there. She looks you in the eye and she said, God, if you was just dripping with honey, I could just... I could. All right, I'm going to leave that alone. Adoration. See, some of y'all ain't right. This is a bad service. Bad, bad, bad service. So, and then look, and look, so adoration. And then, and then look what he says. He said, by prayer, that's general adoration. And then petition. King James says supplication. Once you tell God how you adore him. Then you say, Father, this is what I need. But listen, the highest level of supplication is not what you need. You actually pray for someone else and ask God to meet their need. Parents, when you pray, your first prayer ought to be for your children. And then for you. Husband, before you ask God for anything, your first prayer ought to be for your wife. She comes first. 
Don't ask God to give you nothing. I need a new truck. I need a new rod and reel. Don't ask God for none of that. You say, God, bless my wife. That woman been with me through thick and thin when I was broke, when I was crazy, when I was drinking, when I was smoking dope. That woman stayed with me. She done had my babies in my craziness. Oh, you got quiet in here. All right. <laughs> Ain't no brother saying amen. I got two women saying amen. <laughs> but see, you don't know how people love you because of the good time. You know when they love you when it's the bad time. That's why I know God loves us. Not the good times. It's when I was not what I should be. And so supplicate. And then lastly, appreciation, thanksgiving. Very quickly, very quickly. Very, very quickly. And so you connect with Jesus. You connect with Jesus. And then after you connect with Jesus through prayer, after you connect with Jesus through prayer, okay, Lionel saying, hit it. But after you connect with Jesus through prayer, the Bible also says that, 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 that when you have peace, I might want to check this, that when you have peace, when you don't have peace, several things happen. I'll try it again. Several things happen, and I'll go through these with you very quickly. When you don't have peace, it affects your self-worth. You know, David said in Psalms chapter 22, David said, and David was having all kinds of problems. You know, I told you about it earlier. His children, he had a problem with a relationship with his children. He had a relationship. You know, David had 10 wives. And he was having a problem with some of them. Amen. <laughs> David was having all kinds of issues. And, and David's, but mainly David's enemies were trying to kill him. And David said, I feel like a worm. He said, I feel like a nothing. I feel like a worm. In comprehending Jesus, when we were looking at Matthew chapter, chapter 11, one of the things that Jesus said you comprehend, and this is something David had to learn about God, but one of the things that you comprehend about Jesus when he said, come to me, then he said, connect with me, and then he said, comprehend, that means to learn. He said, learn from me. Learn what? You know what Jesus said? Jesus said, I am meek and I am lowly. Jesus told his disciples, listen, when you guys hook up with me, you're going to learn how to be meek. You're going to learn humility. Now, scholars say that the Romans nor the Greeks had a word for meek, meekness because they considered it such a degrading characteristic. But the Bible took this word for meek and turned it into something special. Meekness means strength under control. It's like taming a wild horse. A horse that is strong, that has a strong spirit, when you tame it, he still is strong, he still has a spirit, it's just under control. So Jesus said, when you come to me, he's telling his 12, and he's telling us, when you come to me, when you connect with me, I want you to learn from me. I want you to learn how I can be spit on and still have my peace. I want you to see me go through six trials where people were paid. Look, these are some of the same people I healed, some of the same people I cast demons out of, but they were paid by the Pharisees to go to court to lie on me, and they knew I knew they were lying, and I just stood there and kept my peace. I want you to look at me and learn how I can have nails nailed in my hand, and I got the power to bring down angels and burn them all up. That's why some of y'all didn't go to the cross. Y'all to burn up everybody. The first lie they told on y'all, y'all to kill everybody, amen. That's why they didn't send you. They sent Jesus to die. Jesus said, learn from me. Learn from me how I can forgive my a man who is considered my best friend, Judas. I fed this man. I prayed for his family. We prayed together. We did everything together. I stopped storms in this man's life, and he got with my enemy, and took 30 pieces of silver to have me murdered, and I knew what he did, and I kept my peace. I want you to learn how to do that. How I can have two men on either side of me talk about me like a dog, and I can tell one of them after he changed, I'm going to remember you when I come into my kingdom how I can stand on that cross with nails in my hands and in my feet and I can say, Father, forgive them. 
He said, I want you to learn how to do that. And when you learn how to do that, you keep your peace. See, unsafe people walk by sight and their peace is external. Saved people walk by faith and their peace is based on what's on the inside, not the outside. And he said, you learn clarity. And let me tell you what clarity is. I'll move very quickly. Clarity is where you know. James said we fight because we don't get what we want. And sometimes we expect people to give us something they can't deliver. Why are you expecting an apology from somebody who's never apologized to anybody before? They're not going to get How can a person give you love when they don't even love themselves? And you're all stressed out. Your nerves bad for because you're expecting people to give you something they cannot deliver. And you got to have clarity. James said, instead of asking them, you ask God. Very quickly. Very quickly. When you don't have peace, it affects your self-worth. We talked about that. It affects its extra work. When, when Lot got into a war and got taken into captivity, Abraham had to raise an army to get him delivered. It takes a lot of work when people are added all, it, into it all the time. You got to get this one together. You got to get this one together. You got to straighten this out. You got to straighten that out. You got to figure out how to get these people talking to each other. It's extra work. It's also extra work on your body. When you are stressed out, your blood pressure goes up, it works on your heart, it affects your kidneys, it affects your liver, your back hurts, your hormones go crazy, you, don't, you eat too much or you eat too little, your feet hurt, your head hurt, your ear hurts. Have you ever had people, they walk into the room and then you get a headache? You go into a place where they are and you gotta take a volume, you say, ooh, let me take my nerve pills, right? Because she's going to be there, and, you know, I don't want to have to go off on somebody and set it off in here. So I'm going to have to take me a little something, something, so I won't set it off when I go in there. Maybe I'm the only person who know about that, but some of y'all know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about some people that can set you off. Okay, let me move very quickly. I'm out of time. What worry is, where is it when you are pulled in two different directions at the same time? Your hope pulls you in this direction, and your fears are pulling you in that direction, and that causes stress. That's word. The English word comes from a German word, which means to strangle. Wrong thinking, what worry is, is wrong thinking, which leads to wrong behavior, and it's wrong thinking about people, circumstances, your past, and possessions. When you have wrong thinking about people and their behaviors and things, that leads to worry. And Paul said that in the book of Philippians. When you worry, your problem becomes your God. Listen. Anything that's the, the biggest thing in your life, that's your God. And when your problem becomes bigger than Jehovah, your problem now sits on the throne. And that's your God. And I want to say to somebody, put God back on the throne. Take your problem off the throne. God is bigger than anything life can throw at you. Any bigger? Any bigger? Any bigger, we're winding down. The problem with worry, let's look at Matthew chapter 6 very quickly. Very quickly, look at Matthew chapter 6. The problem with worry is this, is this. Here's the problem. Look what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, and look at verse 25. By the way, this is the hardest verse in the Bible. Matthew 6 and 25. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry. This is the hardest verse in the Bible. I don't know a person who hasn't worried. I worried about some stuff when I came here today. But God is saying he doesn't want you to be in a constant state of worry. First of all, worry is illog illogical. Look what he said. He said, therefore, do not worry about your life or what you will eat or drink. You know why it's illogical? If God can speak the universe out of nothing, if he can hang the sun on nothing, if he can raise a dead man from the grave, Surely he can put food on your table. Yes, if he's got that, so it is illogical to have a God that can create a universe with billions and billions of stars and can't feed you. It's ineffective. Look at the text. Not only is it illogical, it's ineffective. Look what he said in verse 27. Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? Worry won't make you live longer. In fact, it'll shorten your life. 
the King James Version says, can any person who worries add a single cubit to his height? I don't care how much I worry. I'm not going to be 6'6". Six, six. That ain't going to happen. So why I worry about it like I'm not, I'm talking about, well, I, I want to be like uh, 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 Capella. I am not going to be Capella. A uh, LeBron James. Worrying is ineffective. It won't add years. In fact, worry will take years away from your life. And then he says, worry is irreligious. Look at verse 32. For the pagans run after these things. He's saying, when you worry about whether God's going to provide for you and I all the time, he said, you are behaving like pagans who don't know God. They, wor they don't know God. But you know, if you know God, raise your hand in here. Anybody know him? You know him. Now, does he know you? Raise your hand. Does he know you? Oh, yeah. Yeah, the song says he walks with me, Winston, and he talks with me. Has God talked to anybody in here in your spirit? And he tells me, I am his own. Like the old folks say, I know that I know that I know that I know that I know him. And so, as we wind down very quickly, you need to know that your peace is possible, it's on purpose, and it must be protected. Very quickly, if you look at... Uh, Philippians chapter 4, go back there, and just very quickly, I won't go through all of them, but look at how you can protect your peace. You protect your peace by protecting your mind. And look at Philippians chapter 4. Before you let anything in your mind, it needs to pass these gates. Look what he said in Philippians chapter 4. He talks about peace. He said in verse 7, and the peace of God which transcends understanding. He said, now to get that, you should guard your hearts. Verse 8. Here is how you guard it. He said, number one, before you let something in your spirit, in your mind, first of all, is it true? Does it pass the reliance test? Most stuff folk worry about is not even true. And don't ever spend your life trying to run down a lie. My daddy say, the, bigger, the closer you get to it, the bigger the lie going to be. Whatever is noble, that's the respect test. Whatever this is, does it lead for greater respect for you and your walk with God? Does it pass the righteousness test? He said, whatever is right, does it, is it reverent to God? Does it lift God up? Does it pass the purity test? Whatever is pure, has it been refined? Is it contaminated with anger and jealousy and resentment and greed and selfishness? Is it loving? He says lovely. That's loving. Does it pass the relationship test? And then he said, is it admirable? If it was reported what you were thinking about, would it be a good report or a bad report? So let's close. In 2020, we have three more days, I believe, and we're going to be in not only another year, but another decade. Yes. Another decade. I've seen the, this is me personally, you can talk, talk about your decades. I've seen the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, the 10s, and now I'm into the 20s. For me, I'm getting ready to see my seventh decade. And I know it ain't nothing but the grace of God. I'm still here. I don't know about y'all, but it's the grace of God. But the question is, how do you want to enter it? This is a list of some of the stressors and the stresses and the worries that we have had in 2019. Look at them. Sick children, rejection, failures, aging parents, in-law problems, job loss, marital problems, a painful past. Some of us got some health issues that we're struggling with. Somebody's got to have some surgery. You got to have some tests done. Caring for grandchildren. Uh, some of you are having to take care of your grandchildren in a way you never dreamed. You got some unpaid bills. You got some bills now you don't know how you're going to pay. This stuff have kept you. Some of y'all got issues with your ex. Some of y'all with your current. You're stressed. You're stressed. You've cried when the doors were closed. You seemingly have been forced to make some decisions you never dreamed you'd have to make. God, listen, listen. I started off with this box here.
This represented the gift of Jesus. When you open this box, you get peace. But there's another part to this box, and that's this. Jesus said, when you open the gift, you bring peace and freedom out. But Peter said in the word of God, cast all your wearers and cares upon him. Jesus said, with my box, you can take things out of the box, but you can put things in the box. Break it down very softly for me, guys. Very softly, very softly. I gave you, I gave you some cards. You got some cards. I, the church gave you some cards. Listen. In Isaiah, very softly, guys, very softly. In Isaiah, Isaiah said, don't you know, haven't you heard, that God is an everlasting God. He gives strength to the weary. He gives power to those who are weak. I want you to stay with me now. And he said, stress ain't an age thing because even young people fall. Even you stumble. But I like this part. He said, but they that wait on the Lord, they that trust in the Lord for their peace. He said, they shall mount up with wings as eagles. As eagles. God wants you to soar, but you cannot soar when you weigh down with this. You can't soar in your business. You cannot soar in your career. You cannot soar with, with being the type of father and a husband that you want to be. You cannot soar when you're burdened down with these worries and stressors in your life every day. So God said, I'm going to give you peace, but I want you to cast your burdens. Give them to me. I'm going to give you something, but I'm asking you to give me something. Give me your worries. Give me your stresses. The cards that you receive, here's what I want to ask you to do as we're preparing to close. Write down the one or two things that has really worried you in 2019, and we're going to give it to God so we can leave it in 2019 and not take it in 2020. He said do it. Paul said, I know. Raise your hand if you need a card or a pen. This is real. Paul said, I know in whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've deposited to him. God is begging you, give it to me. It's making you sick. It's weighing you down. Give it to me. And this is for our old as well as our young. God said, give it to me. Listen, religion ain't a game. Life is not a game. This is for real. And here's what we're going to do. Here's what I'm going to do. And I'm going to give you a moment to write it down. And you can write down as many as you need. After you write it down, I'm going to put this box on this table. And I'm going to give you an opportunity to just come around and just drop it in this box. And you know what we're going to do? I'm going to seal it with this top, symbolizing the fact that you've now given it to Jesus. And you know what? On December 31st at 12 noon, I'm going to come and I'm going to get this sealed box. I'm going to come up to this church. I'm not asking you to come. This is some at the shepherd of this church that I'm going to do. Of course, we have our other shepherds who love you, and they're going to be praying for you about all of this too. But I'm going to come up here at 12 noon, and I'm going to put this box on this communion table. Communion means to share. I'm going to get on my knees, and I'm going to ask God to take it and keep it. You don't have to put your name on the card. I don't need your name. I just need to see your pain. God will connect the pain with the name. If you choose to put it on there, fine, but we're going to pray over it. I'm saying to somebody here, try God. Give it to God. Because he cares. 
If any of you would like to bring it right before we stand, you can bring it right now. Those of you would like to bring them, and we're going to give you a moment. We'll give you a moment, but any of you who would like to drop it off, you can. Cast all your cares up on the Lord. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Up on the Lord, up on the Lord. Cast all your cares. Give it to God. Give it to Jesus. Give it to Jesus right now. Give it to God right now. Give it to God right now. Up on the Lord. For he cares, for he cares for you. He cares for you. And he knows, and he knows, and he knows. Thank you, thank you very much. Cast all your cares. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Cast all your fears. Cast all your fears. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Cast all of them, all of them, all of them. Cast all of them. Give it to God. Give it to God. Yes, yes. Please stand with me. Stand with me right now. Stand, stand with me right now. I need everybody to stand. I need everybody to stand. And we're about to pray right now. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Yes. Thank you, thank you. We're about to pray right now. What I'm going to do right now, on behalf of this church, I'm going to ask God's anointing. I'm going to put this top on it, sealing the fact that it's been turned over to God. Once and for all. And, and you know, I, I know this has been a tough year for many of you. It's been a tough year. But God is able. Just tell the person next to you, God is able. God, God is able. God is able. God is able. And I just want to say something for, for you. I believe God's going to show some of y'all some stuff you never dreamed God has for you. The best is yet to come. And I'm going to ask God's anointing on this box. Father, we love you. There is no God like our God. Father, you wrap your gift up through 42 generations. 
Each generation had to deal with generational pain and burdens and weariness and curses while Satan tried to block the gift. But thank God Satan couldn't block the blessing God has for us. And so we thank you for Jesus. And Father, because of that gift, we stand here today covered by the grace of God. Father, right now, in this box, has the worries, the stress, the fears of your people. Father, the stress has caused strain and tears, heartbreak. But right now, Father, right now, right now, we give it all to you. Not some of it, not part of it. We give it all to you right now. And Father, we just ask that in return, you give us your peace. A peace that only comes from a touch from the Holy Ghost. And so, Father, right now, we declare it done. In the name of an almighty God and his son named Jesus. Father, we know that even here in this body of believers, there's going to be some empty chairs on this new year. But replace that emptiness with a calmness and a peace that only comes from knowing an almighty God. There is grief. There is disappointment. But Father, we sealed it all in this place. And we just know that this coming year 2020, eyes have not seen, ears have not heard what you got in store for your children. So Father, right now, we call it done. The victory is already won. We ain't looking for it. It's already there. We're just going to claim it, Father. In the name of Jesus, Mary's baby, our Savior, in Jesus' name, let the church say amen.